Hi everyone, and welcome to the Great Days Golf Pirate Podcast, hosted by me, Mike Jones, aka Captain Pirate. It's been going a few weeks now, and I just want to give people a bit of a background of my story, why I'm called Captain Pirate, for instance. I'm a leg amputee. I lost my leg in a motorcycle accident about five years ago. I was hit off my motorbike. A very serious accident, and, and I sustained life-changing in, injuries. But I started playing golf again. Yeah, and it was great. I was playing disabled golf all over the world, won different tournaments. And I was playing at the Celtic Manor one day with Scott Quinnell. He's, he's a good friend of mine, and we play a lot of golf together. And he was doing one of his Instagram videos where he films all the scenery and just says, beautiful morning. And I photobombed it on my single-seater <laughs> on my single seater golf buggy just went past saluting and he just shouted out you look like a captain pirate today Jonesy and that was it that's where the name come from a pirate because of my one leg and captain pirate because I was saluting him on one of his videos so uh, that's where it came from so I just wanted to give you a bit of background before we crack on with this week's episode which is an absolute cracker I've got a Welsh legend on the show this week a former Ryder Cup captain, former world number one. Uh, it, it, I'm just so excited to get going. Yes, it's Ian Woosnan on the show with me this week. So let's get going with the Pirate Podcast in association with Great Days Golf, bringing golfers together. Joining me on this week's podcast, I'm delighted to say we have a Welsh sporting icon, former Ryder Cup captain, world number one, and major winner. And he's got an OBE to boot. It's Ian Woosnam. So welcome to the podcast, Ian. Thanks, Mike. And, uh, how was, how was uh, the times been these last few, say, six months or so with lockdown? Uh, has it been the same for you? In, I think it's in Jersey you live in now. Yeah, in Jersey at the moment. Uh, usually at this time of the year, I'm in Barbados, nice and warm. But uh, oh. it's funny enough, I left there pretty well a year ago. So it's uh, been a lockdown for a year for me, pretty well. But a little bit different in Jersey. We are a little bit more advanced than what you are at the moment. It's, uh, you know, we've only got like, I think we're a population of 100,000. We've only got seven at the moment, something like that. Oh. So uh, it's very That's good. positive then. Yeah, and we're sort of back in the restaurants and whatsoever, so we can get out and mix in and everything. So, well, you, you very yeah. kindly invited me uh, last year to come over and play some golf, but unfortunately, the the COVID situation happened that just messed up everything for everyone. I I was so looking forward to playing some golf in Jersey, you know, with you obviously, but in Jersey itself because I'd never played there, so. I don't yeah. know if people realise how many fantastic golf courses they got. Um, is there one particularly close to you that you're fond of? Well, uh, yeah, it's called Le Moy, and uh, you know that's where they always had the Jersey Open there. But ah, we, right. So um, we also have the Royal, which is where Ari Varden started playing his golf and was born there. Uh, so oh, yeah, you learn uh, something new every day. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, Le Moy is you know it's a really good golf course. Nice to play, and you know I've been here for thirty odd years, but been coming coming to uh, Jersey for a long time, playing the Jersey Open, and uh, managed to win it one year. I think it was nineteen eighty seven, and uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to come here to move here, and I I took it with, with oh. both hands because it's a beautiful island, and you know it's a nice place to fetch up your children. Well, hopefully we can we can get our game in sometime soon. But uh, but the Legends Tour, they they're back. Back in Jersey this season, is that still on, or do you think uh, I, COVID has affected it? I think COVID's affected it. I think they would like, you know, I think it. I, I have heard on the grapevine it's not going to be on uh, because of you know they wanted to move it later in the, in the summer. But you know the club has got so many appointments, so many things going on. It was difficult to 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 manage to get it into a schedule. So I think what they want to do is make sure they want to. Do it absolutely perfect, and uh, I think they're going to move it to next year to really. Yeah, this, as you know, like I, I've met you out uh, a few times traveling, and when I when I'm on my golf uh, golf days and doing my disabled golf, I, I remember the first time I bumped into you at the, I think it was the Forest of Arden where we had spoken, but 
first time I met you properly, I was in the practice, don't you? Ready, <laughs> getting warming up for the pro am, and you came across to do your little bit of practicing. I don't know if you can remember, but I think I chipped two in and it, the other three about six inches. And you went, I hope you're not playing tomorrow. And then just carried <laughs> on with your chipping. And damn, damn. All I want to say is thank you because that really boosted my confidence. I thought, if Ian Woosnam is saying that about me, then I'm doing the right thing. But I, I don't know if you can remember that, but it, it anybody, had a big impression on me. Anybody who holds two and then knocks others close, uh, I think uh, you might be winning the tournament. Might be just playing in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't. I didn't play that well in the pro out man. I was a bit too nervous. <laughs> you, you always waste them on the practice ground. See? Yeah, that's, such that's it. <laughs> so this. Um, the first topic I really wanted to get into, lots of people know that you live on the border between Wales and England and the golf course you played at was important and the farming background and the strength in your arms and how far you hit the ball. But who, who I, I haven't heard this in any of your interviews, who were your golfing heroes when you were growing up? Or did you, or heroes in your local area, maybe if it wasn't a golfer? Well, obviously, you know, when we, started getting well, getting a TV and it was black and white when we first had one and then we got a colour and, and my dad was always a great sportsman if he you know if he you know, was a farmer but he you know, played soccer football and he always wanted to be a boxer he, that's what, ah, that's what right. his match. Uh, but his parents said no you Harold you're going to be a you're going to be a farmer and that's it so yeah. he, he always promised any if he had any children, which was any good at sports, he would support him as much as possible. And he did that. And he took me around everywhere. And, you know, I, we always used to watch the TV and it was always the big three, wasn't it? Jack, Nicholas, Gary Player and Arnold Palmer. But I think especially, I think it was Gary Player because he was always the smallest and against the big ones. So <laughs> I, I had a sort of like, he was one of my heroes playing, coming up and, but I, I got a quite a few, you know. Tom Watson was one of my heroes. I just wanted the way he swung the golf club, the way yeah. he went about his business. You know, he was a very aggressive player, and that's how I wanted to play the games. So, you know, you play to win. Yeah, that, that, that's the bit that yeah. you emphasised on me. I, I spoke to you. I just got to number one in the European Disabled Rankings, mm. and I, I asked you a very quick question. Once you get there, how do you maintain it? And I remember you saying you've got to have that hunger. You've got to have that hunger to stay there. And I'll never forget that and that aggression. That's right. And you know, I uh, you've got to have you know, I you, I always went played to win. You know, no, not really anybody remembers second place. So, uh, so I just had that attitude of playing. So I'd rather win. I'd rather win once and have five seconds. You know. So, <laughs> Yeah, and then when I got to the world money, so I always put my levels very high. So it's like yeah. I, I describe it as a, a mountain, really. You know, if you go for the top of the mountain, you'll find it easy to get halfway up the mountain. But if you yeah. only if you only go for halfway up the mountain, you only get quarter of the way up the mountain. So always set your heights very high, and and, and it's you know, you're okay. You might not get to the top, but uh, you'll get further than what you thought you were going to get anyway. We were talking about heroes, and you mentioned, you know, Jack and Gary and Arnold. So this leads me into the next thing I want to talk about, and that's the magic of Augusta. When you finally got to play there, and you're emulating those heroes, is it as special as people say it is? Does yeah, it but when you get to Augusta and you, you you're driving down. Magno, you're just driving down, you know, the road outside uh, Augusta, and then you drive down Magnolia Lane, and uh, you get you you drive up down these Magnolia and there's practice ground on the right it used to be, and another little practice ground ground on the left, and you drive up, and it's just sort of smallish, you know, old-fashioned building, not that big, and you think, well, this is you know, it looks great, but it doesn't look very big. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you, you go into the clubhouse, you know, which is, you know, like an old southern house, really, Georgian house, and you, you go in and then all of a sudden the other side is this. It's like, it's imagine what it's like going to heaven, I would have thought. Yeah. And all yeah. of a sudden you're, just, you're, you're up at the top and you're looking down at the course and it's just Melanders all over the place. And you can, you can see, you know, five or six holes from one 
made me more from one spot from the clubhouse and especially in, it's obviously completely different when all the crowds are there and yeah. you know I just it's just like walking into the Garden of Eden, Eden. Oh, I don't wow. know why I got it yeah so it is very special every time you go there so are you hoping to go this year yeah uh, 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 not a, a year last January I had a back operation yeah so that's been very successful. Although oh. the last couple of weeks has not been so good, I've been feeling fantastic, and I feel a lot better with my swing, a bit more looser. But uh, all of a sudden, I don't know. It's just doing that extra bit of practice for because I want to play. Ah, right. I decided yeah. to play again, and uh, you know, the reason why to have a have a an operation was to play Augusta, and another reason yeah. was I want to you know grandson. I've got a grandson now, and I want to play golf with my grandson. And that yeah. was another reason to have in the back operation as well. So, so I'm you know, really excited. But, you know, I've gone from basically seeing you at the Forest of Arden. That's the yeah. last time I played in the tournament. So I'll tee it up at Augusta and it'll be 18 months. So, wow. I've gone from the Forest of Arden. <laughs> to uh, the Forest of Eden. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, I'm going to be a little nervous, I think, because, you know, all of a sudden you're standing there and thinking, I haven't had a card in my hand for 18 months. and I'm not played in a tournament, so that's one I just other, wonder what I've got, yeah. The other one is the nerves. Like, you were a successful Ryder Cup captain, and you had a great Ryder Cup career. Played, I think it was eight Ryder Cups you played in, and I played in a, a small disabled version of the Ryder Cup in uh, Florida, where... Yeah. There was no fans. There was just basically 12 of us guys uh, went over and we played against America and we beat them in the singles on the last day to win it. But I remember in my match being all square, playing the last, and I was playing this guy, Gary Hooks, a great disabled player, one leg player, the same as me. And I was stood over my second shot to the 18th. And it was, I think it was 165. It's nice and warm in Florida in there. And I thought... I've got, I'm hitting the six iron, I'm hitting the six iron, and I have never felt adrenaline like that in my life, my whole body was shaking, managed to hit the shot, managed to win the hole, and we, I didn't win it personally that time, but we won the tournament, and it was an amazing feeling, but it made me think of how do professionals play with that much adrenaline coursing through your Things like your your pet at Augusta, the, that final pet. It must. How do you control it, or do you just go with it? You go with it, and but it's nothing like experience. Experience like uh, nineteen eighty two. I hadn't won a European event, but I'd finished five seconds. Oh, and I wow. just couldn't get over that hurdle, and I, I used it. I learned, as I say, you learn from your experiences and. I learned how to control it, and eventually I did win in Switzerland. And uh, it was just a basically, you know, you're playing against a guy. You are playing against that guy, great player, but he's most probably feeling it exactly the same inside as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I think it's learning how to keep calm and stay in your you stay in your routine. That is the main. And then, especially if you if you are a, a, you know, you've got that adrenaline going through you, so basically go down a club real you know you you could have most probably quite most probably pumped the seven iron in there most probably <laughs> you know sometimes it's what i would do is back foot it a little bit and knock it in there yeah but that was good it's good to feel the nerves if you don't feel the nerves what's the point of being out there that's right this you you have to have that goal and it just goes yeah. back to what you said earlier i think it's important for us to set ourselves goals as golfers yeah, so, I think yeah, I think it's obviously yeah, you know, it's a bit different when you get on the putting green. It's <laughs> all right hand goes a little bit. You know, that, <laughs> not a great feeling, you know what I mean? No, no. Uh, <laughs> but so, you hold, yeah. you hold enough good ones. Never mind the ones uh, that you've missed in the past. They they don't matter. You have to put them behind you. So uh, it's, it's great when people say that. You know, you go to a psychologist and you know, a sports psychologist and says, uh, try and remember you. So I remember your great putts and your great shots. I think, yeah. 
oh, I think I must have Alzheimer's or something because we can't remember it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's amazing how those, yeah. Yeah. It's like amazing how those ones uh, yeah. stick in your mind. It, it just that, you, yeah, that put on the 18th. It's you know, it's you're at there. I am that played the last two days, as I said, with Tom Watson, and yeah. I'm standing there. It's what seven feet, and it's it's. It's the ball outside the hole. I couldn't have asked for a better putt, slightly uphill. And, you know, and I just said to myself, one of the things I had, like, is that if I missed it, I was going to be in a playoff. So, yeah, I was self analyzing myself and making myself calmer by yeah. taking a little pressure off myself. And, I, and if I missed it, it wasn't the end of the world. So, that. You know that helped me to breathe and concentrate and and put a good stroke on it. And you know that I stood there and I think, well, you know, I want. I've been waiting for this minute, this moment, all my life, practicing on the on the putting green. That's one of my golf yeah. course. Saying to the lads on a Wednesday night when we used to go up there when we were kids, ten years of age. I'm Gary Player. The other one would be Jack Nicklaus. You know, and other one would be Arnold. Yeah. I got this for the Masters. I got this for the Open, and you know. That moment came true. Oh God, it must have been so exhilarating and unreal. And you, I suppose you just want that moment to last forever. Then you don't yeah, want it to end. That lasted, and then you know, then I, I, I reached my pinnacle. You know, I came, I came number one that week, and I won the Masters that week, when my first major. And wow! I I got to the top of that mountain. Yeah, and unfortunately, I poured off the other side because well, you were there a while. I did, yeah, but I didn't set enough of goals. You know, I should have. Mm. For some reason, I tried to change things. I tried to change my swing, and I thought, you know, now I look back, that was a great big mistake because yeah. at the time I seen what Nick Fowler was doing this, and I thought, you know, he's winning major. I need to do. I needed to be a little bit more consistent, and yeah, and it backfired on me and. And you're traveling around the world and there's a lot of pressure on you and a lot of media. You know, I see yeah. these guys doing it now. I don't think I, you know, it might have been different. I might have, I might have been, had to have done it and I would have accepted what they do now. But yeah, I find it very difficult. I just, you know, if I shot a 77 and, you know, because I'm world number one, I've got to go and talk to the press and I'm saying, why I got to pop, talk to the press? I'm 77. Mm. You know, I found that very difficult. Yeah, um, but you know, it's that's something you have it's, to do. It's, it's it's the pressures, isn't it? The of the high end of the sport you were at would were just phenomenal. Those those pressures, and I think us as listeners don't really appreciate that sometimes of what goes on when the pros don't don't play as as good as they know they can play. That must be an extreme pressure to have to go and analyze it then and speak to the media after. I I couldn't think of anything worse. All I want to do when I shot an 85 or something yeah. and I, I want to drown I want to drown my sorrows but uh yeah well that's true you have to go there they do give you the space to do it now you know there's, you, you've seen yeah. times with Monty you know if he just wouldn't speak to the press and things like that but yeah but uh but you know the guys are, they're excellent but they're they've been fetched into that world now you know yeah straight from college they've, sort of bred, bred. Whatever. They've, they've been coached to doing it properly in, in college and all that mm. stuff as well so yeah it's a different ball game now so good oh, for them you've you've actually mentioned a couple of the things in my little quiz i do a little <laughs> quiz every week with uh, right. my guests only four questions and it's a uh, so you think you know it's called so it's right. questions that people think now, normally I'll do it for someone else. So last week I did it for Rachel. I did Tiger Woods. Right. Four things she didn't know. But this week, you, Ian, it's you. It's going right. to be Ian Woosnam. So let's see. I got four questions about Ian Woosnam for yourself. So the first question is, you won the Masters in 1991. Jose Alapa was second. Laddie Watkins was third. But can you name any of the three players who finished joint fourth that year? Well, it, it, it was Tom Watson. Oh my God! Yes, straight in there. It was. I'm playing with him, and unfortunately, like he, he had a go at his first putt because he obviously yeah. thought I was going to win, and then he missed the one coming back. Oh. I thought he, I thought he was tied third. Yeah, I got tied fourth, so it was 
Lacobal was second, Lanny Watkins was third, and there were three players then. That was Ben I Crenshaw, well, Steve Payton, and right. Watson. I'm going to pull you up on it. I don't blame you. It's Wikipedia, so don't blame me. Because, <laughs> uh, wait a minute, uh, we were all level going up the first, up the 18th, so we are all 11 under par. Uh, Watson Watson took double bogey to finish nine under par. That's it. Elizabeth yeah. uh, had a bogey, finished 10 under par, and, what, and Lanny Watkins was 10 under par. Nine under par. Nine under par. I'm going to write the Wikipedia myself when this is finished. Yeah, <laughs> You've got to go on to have a go on to the Masters and you'll see it. I know it's true. I've got it. I'm going to I'm going to check that one out and write to them and tell them Correct. that I've been told by the, someone who was there. As yeah, I say, Wales, I was there. So question yeah. number two. I'll, I'm going to give you that one. There's no question right, about yeah. that. When you got to world number one, you stayed there for 50 consecutive weeks. But who knocked you off the top spot and only held it for one week later? There you go, Fred Couples. Oh, yes. You're on fire. <laughs> and I, I can't believe Fred was only number one for a week. Yeah, it's strange. Such that, a talented um, player. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah. And I was see, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys coming or, coming through at that time as well. I think. Yeah, but you've had some ding dong battles with uh, Fred at the right. How many times did you play him in the Ryder Cup? Three times, I think, and I lost every single time. Oh, I did get a half on one. No, two halves, and one loss. Yeah. Is so, he? Is he? Is he? He seems like such a great guy. Is he as good as guy as he comes across, or as cool as he as it comes across? Uh, yeah, he is. You know, he is. You know, he's, he, he can get he can get angry. Oh, he, right. Oh, he can get very angry. I think he was. We were playing at the Belfry, and I'm playing in there at the Belfry, and uh, and he was two down after eleven, and someone was ackling him a little bit, and I said, oh, "Don't oh. take any notice of it, Fred," and proceeded to have a couple of birdies after. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last good advice I give you. <laughs> and I was on the 18th green, and it's, and I hadn't won. I'm saying I still haven't won a single match, and uh, he he knocked his putt down. I give it to him for a par, so I had this sort of like I don't know, 12 footer down the hill at Belfry for a win. God, I knocked it four foot past. Oh I couldn't God. believe it. And Fred said, he said. I, he said, if you had knocked it to two and a half, what I would have given you, but I couldn't give you a <laughs> God, thought, Oh, my God, here I go. I've got to go lose this. Oh, you know, but anyway, I knocked it in, thank God. So two out of two so far, Ian. That had a funny feeling. The other one might have been, it might have been BJ Singh, but no, I think he's he was, he was close. I think he's the one who took over from Fred then, and he was I there for a while. So question three. You, you topped the money list first in the, uh, for the second time in 1990, you beating Mark McNulty in the second place. You won three times that year in 1990. Can you name the French tournament you won? Uh, uh, the, the actual is called the Cannes Open, yeah. Uh, the, Monte, the Monte Carlo Open. Oh, the Monte Carlo Open. The Monte no. Carlo Open. No, it's not right. That's another one. Wikipedia is failing me big time today. Well, that's America, and on Wikipedia, and Mon where is the Monte Carlo? Uh, it's Monaco. a country of its own. It's not yeah, France. Yeah, that's right. So oh, I want it three that times. Could be my, that could be the word in my question. It's an absolute disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I never said I was the sharpest tool in the box. <laughs> I might be right in golf, but I'm not very good on computers. That's why I said dance, because it's in France. Yeah, yeah. You would have been... <laughs> You're right. I can give you three out of three. I don't think I'll even bother asking the fourth because I question. Because I won, I won, I won Monte Carlo three times in a row. That was my now, third time. I, I met a, a group of young... Uh, a group of older gentlemen, sorry, at the 2010, because you know, I play my golf at the Calvin yeah. Manor. And they let me go through on the 18th tee. And I, I was on my little one-way uh, scooter. They watched me tee off, and thank God, I, a nice big drive over the bunk was on the left. We got down there, I said, thank you for letting me through, gentlemen. I'll have a beer waiting for you when you get in. So I had four Budweiser's waiting for them. They, they come up that big steep bank of the 18th. They were all exhausted. Four cold beers there. We got talking. 
And they said, oh, we'd love you to come and play in our, our course. And uh, I said, where do you play? They said, oh, uh, Monaco, Monte Carlo. Wow. So we, we, when I, I was on the trip in Switzerland where I sent you the photo of your winning yeah. tag at Cons this year, we stopped in Monte Carlo on the way and I got to play it. Oh my God, what a fabulous, fabulous place. And, and the people I've met just through simple instances and coincidences like that was just incredible. It's amazing. I'll never forget it because it was, oh God, it was right in the early 80s. And I got to Monte Carlo and I stood on the first tee and I stood there and I thought, where'd you go? <laughs> and it, it's improved such a lot. So yeah. when I stood on all the like the bushes were all up high and you just couldn't see anything, couldn't see the fairway. <laughs> oh, down there, so played nine holes, played nine holes, uh, and I walked in and said, I'm going home. So oh, I've, I've got my wife with me, she's been on oh, my girlfriend, I think she was your wife then. So it must have been 83, we just got married, and I tried to get home and I couldn't get home. They wanted a fortune again, or change of ticket. Oh, I'll, God. I'll try and get back into the tournament. Yeah. I couldn't get back in, so. So I couldn't get back and I had to spend a week in Monte Carlo. Uh, it's tough at the top. I know. You know, <laughs> not, you know, I hadn't got a lot of money then. And uh, uh, so I didn't go back for seven years and I won it three times in a row after that. Because <laughs> it's like, it was like Thunder Monarch, you know, it's on slopes yeah. and bank. Yeah, That's it, it, yeah. It's yeah, extremely mountainous. Yeah. <laughs> there must be something about it because I won in Switzerland as well. You, as I'm it, just going to say that the drive at up to the golf club from the valley yeah. below is a bit scary and it I've done it a few it, times yeah. now at night and yeah. it's <laughs> it's like Michael Caine in the Italian job those roads winding up and down yeah anyway no, so no the, the quiz now has sort of been a bit of a, a shambles yeah, just, I'll say it to be polite but I got I, one I last question one, right? this is this is testing Wikipedia's integrity now as far as I'm concerned <laughs> so <laughs> You came close in all the other majors as well, but what year did you finish sixth at the PGA Championships? What year? Yeah. 1986. Oh, no. Wikipedia. Stewart. Stewart. 1989. Hmm. <laughs> Wikipedia. What course is this there? Kemper Lakes. I think so, yeah. Payne Stewart one. Ah, that's... See, I, I just... Tried Not that sure in. about that. I remember finishing six. And yeah. I was in the PJ because one of the best friends I had in PJ. I usually withdrew or... <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. was, were they particularly tough back then, in the PGA Championships? Well, for me, it, they always played it in the hottest places. Oh. It's in Chicago, I think that was. Yeah. Kemper Lake, and, it's, I think. and uh, but it gets really hot there in the middle of summer. Yeah, and but usually they play somewhere where it's extremely hot with all the humidity. You know, it wasn't too bad at, if I remember in Chicago because you know it's, it's got a bit of wind up there. And then they always had that, you know, it was always in that Bermuda rough, and I just I just couldn't play out of that Bermuda rough. I just my action wasn't good enough yeah. for that sort of stuff, and uh, I just didn't know how to play it. I'm better at it now. Because someone showed me how to play, play like a bunker shot. I was trying it's, to come down too steep on it. I was just trying to explain to some of my friends when you play out of it. You, you can't describe it to any when you have to experience it. And when you play out of yeah. it, it's such a different sensation and feeling. You just got to play like basically take take three inches with it before mm. it. And just open it up, take it with it. That's And that's the only way I learned to play it. I was trying to sort of time it too much. But uh, so, yeah, that, I, I'm not sure of that one. Uh, I, I do remember finished six. I'm sure it was Payne Stewart won his first PGA. Uh, you know, he won the US Open after that, didn't he? I think. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, Pinehurst, wasn't it? Pinehurst, yeah. So uh, I, I'm going to review, review. It could well have been 89 then. not very so good at them. <laughs> it might have been a bit, I don't know. So we'll have to have a look at them. Well, I, it'll have to be four out of four then, 100%. I'm not sure. No, I could be wrong on that. Well, yeah, I could be wrong on all of them, but you have to, you're going to, have to, have to go on something else to find out. Uh, there's like one more thing I'd like to talk about, and that's the thing that 
us as Welshmen, I'm a proud Welshman, we felt was long overdue when that was your induction into the World Golf Hall of Fame. We, we thought you needed to be in there a long time ago, but that's just how the powers that be decided to be. Is, does that rate up there with one of your things you're most proud of? Well, it's difficult, really, because Wall of Fame is... We wouldn't, I wouldn't know so much about it if I, because we don't have that sort of thing in England, you know, where you get yeah. an OBE or whatever. It's, it's just like having an OBE or making oh, a right. stir or, or a knighthood in a, for your sport, really. You know, that's what over there was for. But yeah, once now I know more about it, it's, it is something that's, you know, the World Hall of Fame is, you know, it is a, I know it's world all of fame, but it's more of an American thing more than anything. And it's it's a, a gesture for all their great players uh, in America and around the world to to honor them, really. Yeah. Well, as, as I tell you, as, as Welshmen, we are extremely proud of what you've done, putting our small country it, on the map. And it, uh, did, it, it, it was a little bit annoying that I didn't get in when other players got in front of me. Let's put it that way, where I wasn't very angry. I was very angry, to tell you the truth. And, you weren't the uh, only one. We were for you well, as well. You know, it, it, when you become Hall of Fame, it means you can just go to America and play whenever you like. And yeah. never, I didn't have that opportunity. I know I, I have always tried to support the European tour as much as I possibly yeah. can. And I, yeah, as I say, I feel I got shafted a little bit. Uh, the, the Legends Tour, you're making up for it now, Ian, with the Legends Tour, because I've seen the new format they want to do, giving people like me an opportunity to play in it, if we so wish, which is is just incredible. As amateurs now, uh, I don't know if our listeners know, but our, as amateurs, you can now play alongside these legends of the game on a European tour and play three, is it, I'm sure it's the three rounds with them? Would I be right in uh, saying that? Uh, well, you'll get or the pro-am. I think that they're doing a celebrity pro-am now. I think so, yeah. Into certain, on the Legends ones, uh, the, the Legend, uh, Stay Short Legend one, they're going to do, uh, uh, yes, a, a charity pro-am on the Thursday and then play with the pros on you know, three days as well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously on the Sunday, the first two days you play with, you know, obviously Legend and get the opportunity to play. And the Sunday, it's obviously whatever score, you, score you're doing, really. Uh when you, when you, where you are in the drop. I, I think it's exciting times. I, it, I think it, it's a format that's really going to be successful and work. But I'm looking at the, the clock, Ian, as again, time is our enemy. It's, it's, it's coming to the end of what's been thoroughly enjoyable for me, getting to speak to one of my heroes. Uh, I've always looked up to you. I, I started playing golf at 28 years old, 25 years old, sorry, 1990. And I used I, I just wanted to play like you. That's all I wanted to do was hit a Wyatt when I am. And I had a John <laughs> Daly wild thing, red and blue shafted when I am. And I absolutely I, I remember spending months and months and months trying to hit it and I couldn't hit it. So anybody who can hit it at one I am, I take my hat off to them. So uh I I'd, I'd just like to say thanks for being on you. You've been a great guest. You can catch up with more pirate podcasts uh we do them weekly with great days golf and you can see our app at greatdaysgolf.com where you can catch up on our executive partners and our associate clubs and the such like you can catch me on all the social media platforms hashtag captain pirate but from the world famous Ryder cup captain and Welsh superhero, as far as I'm concerned, Ian Woosnam. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. It was great chatting, and hopefully no I'll see you on the fairway soon. Thank you.